Hello and welcome back to the Cloistabelle podcast. In this episode, we're talking about the New Year's Day Doctor Who episode, Resolution. So hi everyone, welcome back to the Cloister Bell podcast. Um, I'm Rob and Liam's here too. Hi there. Hello. Hi there. So, so I was going to say, have you had a good Christmas? But we've kind of just asked each other before we started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, it was uh, Christmas was uh, was quite good. It was nice to spend time with the family. I know you pretty much did the same. And um, did you get any presents? Um. Uh, yes. We're, well, me and my wife decided not to do Christmas for each other much. So we just got like um a few little things. Mm-hmm. Not much. Um and I got um whiskey off my mum, um money off some other people. So <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> Lots a... of socks. Excellent. Yeah, funny enough, uh, I got a pair of socks, uh which are really, really comfortable ones just for walking in the house and I c- so all those things couldn't be happier. They're really comfortable. I love them. Um, you know, and I got a couple. You know, it's like toilet reason after shave, um, and a couple of Paul McCartney albums, which I was really happy with. So yeah, it was all good. That's cool. Yeah. And how about New Year? New Year's Day. Um, for us, we'll have like a, it's like another Christmas dinner. Mm-hmm. So it's quite cool. Do you do that? Well, this is the thing, folks. For me, it was a quiet one. Um, I'm not really fussed when it comes to the UEF, if if I'm honest. Um, yeah. Did we have a? We did actually. Uh, we did have a. Uh, we did have a nice meal this year. Um, mm-hmm. Because for Christmas, uh, we actually went out for uh, for Christmas dinner. Just for yeah. uh, just for a change, which was quite nice. I was on like, Christmas Day. Yeah, yeah, on Christmas Day. Ah. Um, and that was really nice. Um. And it, it was a really, really great atmosphere because there was a. It was actually loads of people that were going uh, that went there. Um, so there was a really good. There was just a really nice atmosphere. And Rob, I got to meet Santa Claus. Wow. Uh, yeah, I know. It was. It was pretty special. Uh, so that was quite nice. Uh, so I really enjoyed Christmas Day. Um, and f- yeah, and, and New Year. It was just. It was just a quiet one in the house, and we did have a nice meal and everything. Um, yeah, that's cool. I did, even though I don't usually watch Doctor Who while it's on Christmas Day I usually wait till later on in the evening I did kind of miss it it's weird isn't it not having it back for Christmas Day yeah yeah it was because when when they announced that they were they were dropping it for Christmas but it was going to be on New Year's Day I was just like all oh, right okay um you know I wasn't particularly bothered but actually on Christmas Day it was a bit weird I did find that I missed it and it's funny because mm. since the show came back it has pretty much been on every Christmas Day um yeah, and it, it's, it, it's kind of funny how it, how it's been how it's a tradition, and now that it's gone, I, d- I, d- I did miss it. Mhm. And um, if we're not if it's not coming back till twenty twenty, yeah, then they're probably going to break the tradition again this year, aren't they? With Christmas Day. Yeah, I mean, I was wondering if it, it was either to do with um, production scheduling, or if it's just a case of. Well, how many episodes can we have something where we bung in something about snow to make it Christmassy? Hmm, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. And have their ratings not been as good? Do you think they perhaps could have been on Christmas Day? I think so, because if it's... I mean, I haven't, re- I haven't read the article or articles, but I have caught a couple of headlines where they said that the viewing figures were quite low. I don't know what the figures were. And I suspect that they'll probably go back up with people catching it on... Uh, on iPlayer, yeah, but yeah, I, I have a feeling because with Christmas Day, everyone's gathered round. You know, everyone's in the same place. Later on in the evening, you've done, you know, you've done all the presents and all the games and the Christmas dinner and everything. So, sort of like, right, let's watch some TV. So, mm-hmm. and then everyone's around, and then New Year. Most people celebrate New Year's with just you know, tend to be more partying on. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. But I suspect that the viewing figures, as I say, that I suspect that the viewing figures would have gone up with um, yeah. with people catching up on it. Yeah, I never know how how well to trust viewing figures. I'm sure it's more advanced now than I think than I than than I think it is. 
but don't they like survey a handful of people and just multiply it exponentially <laughs> i think so yeah i mean it's not an exact science from what i understand i think it is it is a rough approximation but usually it tends you know roughly spot on but yeah i think it is roughly calculated i mm-hmm. think but it, it uh, yeah i suppose it's a bit I suppose it's easier to get the exact viewing figures from people who watch it on streaming than people who watch it live. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, um, it's funnily enough, on the day I watched the episode, mm-hmm. um, I did not get the word association with the name of the episode in New Year's resolution for some reason. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, what's it all about? And then I just clicked. Mm-hmm. Um you got any New Year's resolutions? I don't really bother with them, if I'm honest. The only thing that I've, I, I do, I would like to do this year is more read, uh, is read more books. Yeah. Uh, how about you? Hmm. I don't know. Well, I guess do a weekly podcast is a good one. <laughs> yes, actually, yeah, that that should be top of my Quite list. Quite an important well. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually, yeah, I'll put that at the top of my list, and 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 hopefully, uh, hopefully, be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, in terms of D- Doctor Who, uh, I have I did come across some news. Is there anything that you've come across? I read this morning that there's some audio being recovered. Yeah, that's the news that I've got. Um, it was it was a bit funny because you really have to dig for it, and it was just mm. one of those things. Um, <laughs> it was really rather odd how I came across it. It was just it was sort of oh, I wonder what Mark Ayres is up to these days so I did a bit of a, a, a Google search and this thing that he was linked with on Twitter came up and yeah some some new audio of um, Hartnell and Troughton episodes have been found and what Mark Ayres has said um, for those that don't know Mark Ayres is a um, is a composer is also the archivist for the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and also restores the audio for classic Doctor Who. He did it for the DVD range and now he's doing it for the Blu-ray range. And what he said is, the quality is the most consistent of any collection of these episodes we have found. Many of the episodes here are now probably our best source for future remastering. They are particularly useful given that all cliffhangers and reprises are intact. Um... So that sounds that sounds really good, and some of the some of the audio is for stories that we already have, but so, uh, a lot of the audio is for for episodes that are missing. So the stories are the second half only of episode one of the Daleks' master plan, then the full episodes from episodes two to twelve, mm. then all episodes of the massacre of Saint Bartholomew's Eve, the Ark, Celestial Toymaker, the Savages. The War Machines, Smugglers, The Tenth Planet, Power of the Daleks, The Highlanders, The Underwater Menace, and as far as I can see, only episode one of The Moon Base. Yeah, it'd be interesting to listen to that. Mm. Um, it's something that's never really bothered me, the sound quality. I would just, I'd always excuse it if it was pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, because these are for for the stories that are missing. It's the only thing that we have of the original broadcasts, mm-hmm. um, and the audios that have been available up until now. Uh, Mark Mark Ayres has said in the past is actually they, they they were pretty darn good because what unfortunately I've forgotten the name of the fan who recorded them. It's even more embarrassing as well because um, Doctor Who fandom, because um, uh, the the chap passed away last year, and Doctor Who fandom was. Um, uh, d- d- some remembrance for him. I wish I could remember his name. Um, but what he did when he, uh, w- the way that the audio was recorded was he actually tapped directly into the main microphone of the television. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how these audios have been recorded and how how they're supposed to be better. But Mark Hayes, from what he said, is uh, he's very impressed with them, um, and they will be. The, uh, these recordings will be uh, will be used for future remastering. Yeah, there's another way it might benefit the stories because I know there's been sections of audio, like little snippets of audio, that uh, were blank and they, that were reconstructed. Yeah, yeah, uh, the war machines so, in particular with that. But yeah, right. for, with these ones, uh, it's it's full episode recordings. Excellent. Mm-hmm. So I think that was the major news, and the the only other news I think it's probably stuff that we're already aware of 
we've got season 18 released on blu-ray currently scheduled for next month february um tom baker's written doctor who novel scratch uh, scratchman uh which comes out later this month which i think we're both mm. keen to read yeah um if we're going to talk about it um i might go for the audiobook so it'll be quicker to get through but it's also read by tom baker ah right okay that should be good mm. and i don't know how much of that story um we we'll already know about well, the only thing that I'm aware of is that when Tom Baker was working on his first season as Doctor Who, he became quite friendly with uh, the actor Ian Martyr, who played Harry Sullivan. Mm-hmm. And they written they had written this movie script called Doctor Who Meets Scratchman, or something like something like that. The only the only thing that comes to my mind is uh, Pinball. Uh, what's that? Uh, it, there's a part in the the Scratchman movie that never happened where they're in a giant pinball machine. Oh, right. I, I, don't, I don't know anything about what was... I mean, the movie wasn't made, uh, but they'd written this script. I, I didn't know anything about that. Um, I think... But obviously, it's taken all these years and finally, you know, we, we're getting something out of it with Tom Baker um, writing a novel of it. Yeah. I think because... From what you've just said, and I think because we know it's Tom Baker, I think we know that it's likely yeah. to be absolutely yeah. barking yeah. mad. Um, but th- Unless I, I just totally dreamt that. <laughs> well, who knows? I mean, it, it, it has the realm of plausibility, <laughs> considering it's sort of like uh, we're talking about the imagination of Tom Baker. But I think, you know, it's going to be barking mad, but it's going to be interesting. Um, mm. It's going to have an interesting plot. Um, it's going to be, I think, funny, scary, thrilling. So, yeah, that is a book that I'm looking forward to reading. Yeah, there's not many books that really um, draw your attention. They're all, always ever just a. Uh the typical new series books or the occasional um, novelisation. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, because uh, one thing later on down the line, one one Doctor Who story that we will be looking at is The Three Doctors. And I, funny enough, uh, I've just finished reading the novelisation of that. We'll talk about it when we do the podcast, but actually that was that was quite a, quite an interesting read. Was it a... Um, when did the book come out? Was it at the time of broadcast or was it just further down the line? A little bit down the line, I think, because the story was broadcast 72, 73, and the book came okay. out a couple of years later, 75, I think. Mm. Uh, it's interesting when books come out early, though, because um, there's usually a lot of differences in the story, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't know how much how different The Five Doctors is. I, mean, I think we might have spoke about that a few weeks ago. Yeah, because uh, that was what... I don't know, I think... From what I remember reading somewhere, I think there was a bit of a muck up and it actually came out before the episode was broadcast and mm. that wasn't supposed to be the case, but it was. Um, from, I've never read it. I have got it, so we'll be reading it again because that's another story we'll be looking at um, for a future podcast um, quite soon, actually. So I will be reading it. I'm under the impression, though, that it will be quite close to what was televised with very little differences, but we'll see. Because mm. I know there was a a few different um, story changes, wasn't there? Wasn't there an ending where um, Richard Herndl turned out to be a robot in in um, in Dick's original story, and um, he was meant to be walking around, and like cogs and springs were meant to be coming out of his neck. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because original, well, <laughs> actually, that wasn't Terence Dix. That was when it was Robert Holmes. Because Robert Holmes was originally um, approached to write the script, and okay. It, the original title was The Six Doctors. And the reason being was because because at that point, William Hartnell, who played the first Doctor, had passed away. So mm. he had to be recast. They thought, well, we'll explain the difference of ap- appearance by having the first Doctor turn out to be a robot. And yeah, there was the, there was going to be the scene towards the end where he falls down the cliff and there's going to be all these springs and mechanics <laughs> coming out all over the place. <laughs> but... Uh, but the, obviously that storyline didn't happen and one of the reasons being was because Robert Holmes said I just can't do it this, it's just a shopping list of stuff I'm, I'm not able to create an original story here forget it and then um, Eric Saywood who was the script editor of Doctor Who at that point then approached Terence Dix and then and then we got the story that we know and love so moving on to um, re- I was going to say revolution <laughs> re- resolution this is the DNA of the most dangerous creature in the universe. What? It's 
been buried on Earth since the ninth century. Run! It's not going to stop until it's taken control of this planet. It's going to kill anyone that gets in its path. Does it have a name? There's another story written by Chris Chibnall and directed by Wayne Yip. Uh, yes, um, that's and right, he, yeah. Yeah, he's directed The Lie of the Land, which was the second part of the Monk episode, mm -hmm. and Empress of Mars. And he's also directed two of the class episodes, but you won't have seen those. No, no, not yet. Um, but Because one thing I was going to mention was I think the, the team behind uh, making this episode, in terms of the director and the cinematographer and the editor, uh, as you say, director Wayne Yip, uh, mm. And the cinematographer is uh, Stuart uh, Biddlecombe or Biddlecom, and again he he's previously worked on that's a cinematographer. He's previously worked on Heaven Sent, Hellbent, and The Lie of the Land and Empress of Mars. All right. Uh, and also the editor uh, Edel McDonnell. Again, he's worked on Empress of Mars, The Lie of the Land, and he's also worked on the two episodes of Class that Wayne Yip directed. Um, mm. So there's a, I think they're a very good team together because I don't know about you, but I, in terms of new Doctor Who, and with, with, with this current run with with Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor and Chris Chibnall in charge, I think this is the best looking episode that we've had. Mm -hmm. um, the episodes he directed of Class, um, one of them, the metaphysical engine or what Quill did, that's one of my favourite episodes of the series, uh, but it's one of those episodes centered around slightly different characters going off do, doing something else um but visually it was a really good story mm. it was a bit of a change because it wasn't it wasn't just set in um in coal hill right okay because when i was reading um doctor who magazine issue 533 which was the last uh issue of 2018 um mm -hmm. chris chibnall was talking about um Working with uh, working with Wayne, and Chris Jumman said he was really impressed with how those episodes turned out, especially from a directing point of view. And he mentioned the two episodes of Class, and if you bear with me, because I'm just trying to find the exact quote, but he mentions so I, I can't for the life of me find out the exact quote, but mentioned that one of the episodes that was directed involved it was pretty much set in one room yeah that's um these two episodes that he's directed um happen at the same time right okay. so one of them's detained where the kids are kind of in detention and the second episode's about what the what the um teachers are doing right okay so what chris jibnall was saying was that the fact that um wayne yip managed to make that episode visually interesting was really quite impressive there's a it's it's some of it's um quite effects heavy and there's a lot of um probably motion capture stuff um overlaid with um a lot of effects like when they're in they're in like a woodland area mm -hmm. but it's visually it looks like an alien um forest all right okay um but it looks quite photorealistic, so um, I think um, the cinematography was really good on that episode. Mm -hmm. And uh, just going back to the, the episode of Resolution, because again, quoting Doctor Who magazine, because um, with issue 533, the, the big thing was looking at this New Year special. Um, so what Chris Chibnall had said was, you want the special to feel like an event. It always performs a slightly different function to the rest of the series. You want it to be like an opener and finale all rolled into one. You want it to be accessible to those who've missed the series, but you also want to reward the audiences and fans who've been there for the whole ride. Most of all, you want it to feel like a treat. A big, thrilling, explosive, moving, cheeky, surprising treat. Basically, you want the special to be epic, and I promise it's going to be epic. So... With that quote in mind, do you think uh, Resolution was successful? Hmm. I think perhaps he was overselling it a little bit there. Hmm. I do like the episode a lot mm -hmm. for certain reasons. Um, it does deliver 
more than perhaps um, the series finale did. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. For the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm grateful we did get this episode quite soon after. Yeah, because I think you and I were both in agreement that the last series, although on the whole we did we did like it, the final episode was a bit disappointing. Mm-hmm. Um, because you, you invest yourself in it quite a lot, and I think we felt like we deserved more from the from the character story, mm-hmm. yeah, possibly. Yeah. Mm. Let's talk about the spoiler that was revealed in the trailer. Yes. Um, when they were trailing the story, there was um, the the original trailer uh, mentioned that the Doctor had come across the DNA of the most evil creature in the universe. Now, obviously, the first thing that springs to mind if you're a Doctor Who fan is it's got to be a Dalek. But there was always that sort of that that question mark. You know, it's likely to be the Daleks, but it could be something else, something that we we haven't been privy to. So it was always that that sort of question mark, which which I liked. But then I can't remember quite when it was, but it wasn't all that long ago, maybe a week or two before the episode was actually broadcast. We then had a truncated um, episode, but then we heard the voice of the Dalek. Mm-hmm. And it was just a voice, so I didn't know if it was a joke or if the Daleks were in it, but just as a bit of a red heron. Like like this DNA of this, being, of this alien creature was something greater. Well, considering that it sounded a bit Dalek-y and it said the word exterminate, I thought there wasn't any questions at that point. It was clearly mm-hmm. going to be the Daleks or a Dalek. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought that late... Because one of the things that y- you and I have, have both praised the BBC for uh, with Series 11 is that a, they've really managed to keep a lid on... A lot of things. So when we've been watching the stories the first time round, it's generally been a surprise with one or two things. Mm. And again, it looked like they'd really managed to keep the lid on. So I was really surprised that they they managed that they decided to release a trailer where it made this major thing mm-hmm. perfectly. I can clear. only think of two possibilities. One, there was a leak, mm. which they wanted, to, and they wanted to get the news out first before it leaked, or perhaps. It was a, it was a last minute attempt, um, just to get more attention. And get more view, get more viewers. Uh, possibly, um, I don't. Th- I'm not aware. I can't, of- I can't think of a reason why they would keep it a secret. Then, just go and put that out there. Mm-hmm. It's a strange one. Yeah, I mean, so uh, from that point of view, I thought it was something that they, they th- that they could have kept a lid on, and then. It would have been the major reveal within the story. But then, having said that, though, I think when watching it, I think you go, yeah, of course, it's a, it's a Dalek. I'm not really surprised. I don't know. But it, it was a bit of a shame that they it was it was leaked beforehand. But having said mm. that, though, it didn't it, it didn't ruin my enjoyment of the story. No, not at all. If it if it was because of a leak, it wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be the first time they've had to do damage control. Because I remember the Night of the Doctor mini episode. Mm-hmm. Apparently, that was meant to get broadcast right before the Day of the Doctor. Right. Okay. But but it photos were leaked, so supposedly they put it straight onto iPlayer. I was wondering why it was released on iPlayer because so, I remember because yeah. um, I, I when that was broadcast, I didn't see any of the I didn't see any of the the leaks or anything like that. I was just. I was just suddenly aware that there was this surprise episode uh, that that come out. So when I watched it, the fact that Paul McGann was in it was uh, did surprise me actually. Yeah, and but it was released on Paul McGann's birthday as well, incidentally. <laughs> oh, that's quite a nice touch. All right, okay. Yeah, it would have been good if it was on BBC One though. Yes. Yeah, 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 I agree just, with that. Yeah, just, yeah. just shame they killed him off on iPlayer. <laughs> yeah. Um, but. So, so you were saying that you, 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 you so, so sorry. So going back to resolution, you were saying that you, you liked the episode. Yes, I did. Um, so I'll talk about what I kind of thought um, when we get to the very end. 
Um, there's one thing I noticed at the beginning. It's not exactly unprecedented, but did you notice there's no opening titles? Yes, I did, and I think um, I think at this part, I think at this stage, it was it was a bit of a shame that we you know we didn't have that that beginning. I suppose it would have been a bit a bit jarring given how given how the episode opens up. You know, it's it's straight into the action about mm. this monster, which later turns out to be a Dalek, which was um, what these these ancients were doing. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, it was a bit of a shame, and I, I think it was maybe it was a choice because of the running time of the episode. If that were the case, we'll come back to it later. But it's a bit of a shame because I think there's one thing that could have definitely been edited out. All right. Oh, um, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, um, starts off in the ninth century. Mm-hmm. Um, I found myself asking how these custodians of these pieces of the Dalek mm-hmm. um, with their armies how do you, how could they have defeated the Dalek do you think there was drones of them um, of the Dalek kind of tied down and burnt yeah but how, I, I'm, how do you think they could have it just seems a bit unrealistic <laughs> that they could have defeated it I, I know what you mean but, but having said that though there have been there have been past stories where if where a significant number of people have have ambushed a Dalek with, um, I'm just trying to remember. Wasn't there? Do you remember Death to the Daleks? Yes. Is it was this a? Um... Yeah, go on. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, so. the John Pertwee story. Isn't yeah. there a bit? Because it's been a, it's been quite a while since I've watched that. But isn't there a moment when uh, one of the Daleks gets destroyed by the Exelons through just nothing but bows and arrows? Oh, really? Oh. Um, I may be wrong. There's probably Doctor Who fans screaming, going, "What on earth are you talking about?" But it has been a while. But I, I, I've got this that sort of vague notion. But there have been previous stories where, you know, Daleks have been defeated in a, in a seemingly simple way. But it's obvious. But I think in this case, it was because you know there was a planned ambush, and there yeah. was there was a significant number of people which took the Dalek by surprise. So yeah, I know exactly where you're coming from. But also in terms of the history of the show, it's not beyond the realm of, of possibility. Okay, we'll let them off with that one. But funny enough, the one thing that did um, that did cross my mind initially was, why didn't they just dump it in the ocean? Hmm. I mean, later on, because of the appearance of it, it looks like a squid. So maybe they thought, well, yeah. it could survive in the ocean. But then so like yeah. with, with all this, because they were going vast geogra- geographical distances in order to bury it why didn't they chuck it down a volcano or something as well it could have been a ritual thing from their beliefs uh, possibly po- yeah possibly actually that makes an awful lot of sense mm-hmm. um yeah i'll yeah i'll go with that one i mean don't get me wrong even though that this was a slight niggle when i watched it it was just it it occurred to me straight away but again it wasn't one of those things where it ruined me and Really? Poor Chib, no, we'll just mm. scrutinise his, his stories, don't we? <laughs> well, well, we would do that anyway, regardless of whoever yeah. was writing, because, you know, we're, we're, reviewing, we're reviewing it. If, if we weren't doing a podcast, we'd just sit back and enjoy them. But it's like, we'll, we, get a pet, a pet, <laughs> we'll get a pad of paper and just write down all the faults. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, right, okay. I want to get the faults out of the way, now that you mention them, because... Okay. Um... Cause this is like, I've, I've got a few points, but they're all kind of linear throughout the story. Right, well, this is... Right, okay. This is... Liam has the moan. So, the thing is, when I was watching the episode initially, uh, you know, so I, I liked it. I was enjoying it. Um, but I don't know what it was. It was one of those things where I thought it was an okay to good episode. But, as, but following its broadcast... I found that it really got under my skin and I was thinking about it more. And the more that I thought about it, the more that I liked it. And then I have gone back to rewatch it and I still really like it. So even though I am about to mention a few niggles, which does sound, which will sound like me just coming down on the episode, I want to make it perfectly clear that I did enjoy the episode. So, point number one. And this is just a personal niggle. It's not that the fact that it's, it's written badly. But I have a real bugbear when it comes to narration. So the the episode opens up with a narration 
and then it closes on one. And very rarely do I find that a, a narration which explains things works. I find it, it just really irritates me. I find it lazy writing. Mm-hmm. I find it much more satisfying and much more craftsmanlike if what is explained in the narration is actually revealed through what you see. But that was just mm. a slight bug about it. It was just an, I would have preferred if the narration wasn't there, but nothing major. Yeah, that's not something that bothers me, but I guess they could have done without it. Yeah, and then going on about the dialogue, so this is point number two. I found that there was quite a lot of repetition and exposition, which did irritate me. So, for example, there's a bit when um, they're in the sewers in the excavation site. Then Graham asks the doctor, are you telling me it's roaming around in the water? To which the doctor immediately replies, it looks like it slid down the wall and into the water. Mm. So that's the, that's the kind of thing you'd expect from an audio drama. Yes, it is. It's sort of like, yeah, I, this isn't radio. I can see. I can <laughs> see that that is what has happened. I don't need those lines of dialogue. And secondly... You have informed me of the same thing in two lines of dialogue, one which follows directly on from the other. So mm. there's just, it's a slight irritant, but I feel it's just things like that where I feel you don't need that, and I just feel that the writing just needs to be a little bit more polished. So that's yeah. just, you know, just a little, a little irritating thing. And, well, hang on. You know when I said that there was something that I felt that could have been edited out of the episode, what did you think I was referring to? Oh, well, it was the scene with the family that lost the Wi-Fi. <laughs> right, bingo, that's it, you were right. Because um, that was the other thing as well, just sort of... So you have this bit as well where it's written in where the Doctor... Uh, uh, sorry, where the Dalek uh, shuts down all the Wi-Fi for a joke scene that doesn't work. I can guarantee it generated no more than a fake laugh, a false laugh, a forced laugh, yeah. A forced laugh from anyone. Yeah, just... <laughs> 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 Yeah, it... you know when you know when you're in the cinema and people are like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> or like they just want to like laugh out loud, so they want to tell the whole cinema that they got the reference. <laughs> yes, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I yeah I can guarantee that that's exactly what happened. In fact, I've been at meetings at work where that's happened as well. It's been which is quite bad. <laughs> but yeah, so that was a so that's a bit of a thing. And then um, the other thing is well, we we used to get a lot of stuff like that in the Davis era, didn't we? Probably, I can't think of an example. Can you think? I can think of what? Well, I can think of one time where in Army of Ghosts, where the Cybermen are appearing, and they're appearing in someone's living room. All oh, right, yeah. Uh, you know what? Maybe that's the only instance, <laughs> and I'm judging <laughs> this entire era on that. There's one big mistake. Yeah, it's just going to be sort of the chip equivalent. There's this one jokey scene yeah. in his entire run of the show which doesn't work, and then we're just going to say Chibnall just doesn't do humour. Yeah. Because actually, there, there is another scene which proves that he can. We'll come on to that later. You probably know which one it is. Um, then, the other thing is, it's the use of the sonic screwdriver. It's becoming... F- it's, its use is becoming too much. Um, yeah. I find that... It just irritates me because, again, it, it's one of those things where it, it, it allows, it allows um, dangerous situations... And the doctor and the team to get out of them far, far too easily. So that mm. ir- that that's starting to irritate me quite a bit. I can't recall when she used it, which means she's probably using it too casually, too often. Well, it was the scene where she she, she she's talking to the Dalek, and then she uses her sewing screwdriver to block the, oh, the yes. Dalek's gun. Was is is one which just kind of oh come on. Um. So that's a little bit of a bug there. Um. Justin Cole, who plays Ryan. Now, he's a really good actor. But that scene that he has in the f- with his father in the cafe. Now, you, you may disagree with me on this. But I felt that th- those scenes were written very, very well. And his lines of dialogue, um, as they were written, contained mm. a lot of fire and anger and... Uh, but also, you know, but quite well balanced. I thought, I thought the scenes were, I thought his lines of dialogue were really well written, but his delivery of them was didn't quite match. Hmm. Okay. But again, that's that's 
people may disagree with me because actually he is a good actor and within the rest of the story he he does play Ryan very well so that was just a slight nickel but my major thing and this this is the last point everything else from this point is going to be positive so, so sorry about this uh it's the major lack of Yaz again. Yeah, I've made a note of that. And it's because actually, because th- th- there's a significant number of the uh, there's a significant run of the episode where it's stuck. It's just the Doctor and Yaz when they're in the TARDIS. Mm. And I thought, right, great, we're going to have more of Yaz. But then we didn't. And considering we've got like six companions in this episode, mm-hmm. they didn't bother giving them um, Yasmin enough time, which is a shame. It is a real shame because they've got a good character there. They've got um, they've got uh, Mandid Gill, who's a you know you can tell she's a cracking good actress, mm. and it, it just feels like a major waste of talent. It's it's frustrating, and it's we've mentioned it, and you go elsewhere uh, if you if you're looking for reviews of the show. Everywhere everyone's commenting on it. It's like, Yaz. It's she needs to be used more. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, yeah. It's it's almost like week by week they decide who should be at the foreground of the episode. Mm-hmm. And I suppose with with uh, Graham and Ryan and their relationship and his relationship with his father and his father being introduced to this episode, I suppose it's it's inevitable that um, that Yaz would get sidelined. But again, we have an episode where which features a police uh, features a policewoman who gets possessed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and y- and Yaz was introduced as being a policewoman. It's just sort of, um, is there a trick being missed? I don't, I don't know. But it was it, it was a shame that once again she was sidelined. Mm-hmm. But now yeah. that I've got the moaning out of the way, <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Sorry for that ear bashing on. Just this is what it's got wrong. Everything else though was good. <laughs> everything everything else was good. Yeah, and I know I don't really pay attention, but there's a lot of hate out there as usual. Mm, yeah, but I, I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. We've got a new type of Dalek, the Recon Dalek. Mm-hmm. Do you think it just looked like a new series Dalek, the Bronze Dalek? Originally, I suppose a little bit. I mean, it's it's. I thought for for what it was, it was it was a good design. It looked a bit obviously the whole thing was it was supposed to look cobbled together. Mm. The only problem, and I quite like the design for for what it was. The only moments where I thought it was maybe a bit ropey was some CGI scenes with it, but on the whole, I thought it was a good design. One thing that I really did like was when we're seeing, um, is it is it Lynn, the policewoman? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. When when Lynn, because she's possessed and she's putting the Dalek together, mirrored the Doctor making the sonic screwdriver in the woman who fell in the woman who fell to Earth. It sort of it mirrored. It mirrored that scene a bit, which I thought was a nice touch. Um, yeah, I didn't get that. I didn't notice that. All oh, right, okay. Might just be me over over looking into it then. But yeah. it was it's something that I I thought was, I thought it was maybe a a, a deliberate thing of. Because you know we, we we've got a woman creating a Dalek in in that sort of, in that sort of environment, and we saw and we saw the Doctor, who's now a woman in the in the first episode, creating a sonic screwdriver. So these mm. these two things, these two villain, uh, you know, the, these two characters, the Dalek and the Doctor, and they're both, um, they're both connected over many many years of, of of being enemies of the other, but there's these sort of similarities. Mm. I just thought it was, a, it, it was something interesting. So I thought it's an amazing coincidence that it all happened in present day Sheffield. <laughs> yeah. It's like Sheffield's the new London. Yeah, but that's fine. I mean, you know, the, the, the Britain's too London London centric anyway, and it's quite nice mm. to you know move a bit up north. Yeah. So Ryan's dad made his first appearance. Mm-hmm. Um. It's interesting that we've never met him, but you paint him as the bad guy. Mm-hmm. But he didn't come across um, bad at all, did he? Initially. No, no, in fact... I thought it'd be more arrogant and distance, but I don't know. No, seemed I, quite nice. <laughs> no, no, you did, but that's one of the things I think one... I think Chris Chibnall, one of his strengths is is, is creating really good characters and being able to create um, 
scenarios which are realistic and grounded but allows character development that's his real strength and that's one great thing that he's brought into the show so ryan's father aaron yes he has been depicted as as as, as sort of being a villain and a bad father but principally a bad father and because but let's face it he has been he's been absent he hasn't been taking responsibility mm. but that doesn't mean at the end because you know you, you know we're complicated you know there's there's good things about people there's bad things about people you know it's 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 much more nuanced than whatever so i actually that was one of the things that i really liked about this episode i think it was written and acted very well and i thought it was quite mature so as soon as as, as aaron ryan's father comes in on the scene everyone is you know being mature about it everyone calls him out for what he's done or hasn't done um, everyone's really really defensive aren't they Yes, Especially, and the doctor doesn't seem to have a filter on what comes out of mouth, does she? No, no, that's true. I think that's one thing that is going to be a major character um, flaw, if you like, with uh, with with Jodie Whittaker's doctor, that she, you know, she'll just let her mouth go. But mm. at the same, t- so this was another that was a, this was another situation of that. But it but it was one of those things of, well, really, you can't falter for what she's saying. What she's saying is the truth. And, um, I mean, it's, I suppose Graham handles it a bit more maturely. He takes him, to, he takes him to one side, but effectively says exactly the same thing. But what's interesting about Aaron is he's aware, you know, he, the actor playing him, um, Daniel, oh, I cannot for the life of me pronounce his surname. I'm really sorry. I'm not even going to try. Apologies. But the, the actor that plays him, you know, he's, you know, he doesn't, he plays the part really well. So what he what he how he performs that is, you know, he can tell it's unco- you know it's uncomfortable. He doesn't say anything because there's a lot of truths. The the big scene is between him and Ryan in the in, in the cafe, mm-hmm. and I thought that was that was written really well with um again with Ryan Ryan using the opportunity to go and look. This is the situation. And you've really got to make amends, and you've got a lot of work to do because you've made constant mistakes. And then it, and then Aaron coming out from his point of view, and after trying to make excuses, and trying to, you know, trying to get in Ryan's good book straight away, and Ryan busy going, no, this is not how it works. And then finally, Aaron going, right, well, this is the situation. This is where I'm coming from. I thought that was really good, and it, it provided a really good juxtaposition between. Um, between all the action and the, the 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 scariness of trying to find the Dalek and what was all going in there, and then cutting to this, which was a bit more quieter, mm-hmm. um, but still still dramatic and still interesting to watch. I thought that uh, yeah, I quite like this aspect of the story. Yeah, and it doesn't waste any time mm-hmm. kind of progressing with this part of the story because Ryan's really vocal about um, what he's feeling, isn't he? Yeah, when they're in the cafe, mm-hmm. and then again later on, um, Ryan's dad sitting with Graham, mm-hmm. um, speaking about his perspective. Um, so we got to see um a lot of the whole situation from his point of view, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and that mm. and, and that scene between Graham and Aaron, and when Graham had taken out all of Aaron's childhood stuff uh, that had been that still been kept. That that was a nice scene and and quite yeah. touching. I liked that. Yeah, and again before the scene in the cafe, um, we've got we've got Graham um, giving Ryan's dad a bit of a talking to mm-hmm. in the house. Yeah. Um, and then obviously Ryan comes past and comes past and says, "See you later, Gramps." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and Ryan's dad's got a bit of a reaction to that, and then just Bradley Walsh's reaction to that is pretty great, isn't it? He, he did. It was like um, it was a good performance. He didn't see anything, but he, he seems quite emotional. Yeah, I, again, because I think one of the one of the great things about this series and this episode is no exception is that um, the casting has been superb. Everyone involved, every, every casting has has just been pitch perfect, and every and every actor really coming up to even you know coming up to the mark. It's it's really great performances. Yeah. So uh, the girl controlled by the Dalek, Lynn. Yeah. 
she arrives at her house and I had to rewind and pause it on the house because for a moment I thought it was um, 13 Bannerman Road from the Sarah Jane Adventures. Yes, I, it, I thought that originally. But it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. It, but it did look very familiar. Yeah, yeah, no, I get where you're coming from. I thought that I, did, I, I didn't think it really was. I thought, oh, maybe they're just recycling a location. Mm-hmm. Um, and when she walks um, into her bathroom, um, I didn't know the Dalek... I, I guess the Dalek was hitchhiking on her. I didn't know it was on her back. Mm. I thought, is she going to be sick? <laughs> is it going to come out? But... No, it wasn't the case. <laughs> no, no, but that, I mean, that's the thing as well. This is one of the major triumphs of, of this story, which is the Dalek itself. It was, I thought it was a, it was a brilliant design of, of the Dalek mutant. And my goodness, was that the whole thing was creepy. Um, the, 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 the look of it, the fact it was um, piggybacking off Lynn and, and controlling her. And uh, Charlotte Ritchie, who plays Lynn, Give a great performance through playing um, through through playing Lynn um, as as normal, and then juxtaposed with how she was playing the part of of Lynn being possessed. Especially that you know it, simple thing, but it was very effective. You know when she gives that 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 smile, that creepy smile, with the Dalek, which is clearly the Dalek, you know, controlling her at this point, which is relishing in in the mayhem and the killing that it's that it's causing. Mm. And likewise, that performance, I think Nick Briggs gave um, a good performance there. Um, it's a tricky one. Like, uh, On one hand, I'd like to see more actors come in and give a bit of diversity to the Daleks. Uh, but yes. he does he does give a very good, um, different range, doesn't he, to all the different performances he does? Well, I think in the past, because you've got one chap doing the voice of the Daleks, it's uh, since the show came back. It's it's been Nick Briggs who does a great who who great, um, but yes, I agree with that. It's sort of with every Dalek sounding the same. But when you compare it to the classic series, they always had two, three, maybe four actors doing doing the Daleks, yeah. and so there, there was a bit more variety, and so it was a bit more interesting. And the Daleks, as a result, had you know their own personalities. But with Nick Briggs coming in, it's just just the one actor doing it. Um, it, you know, yeah, I agree with that. Maybe it would be nice if if they brought in just another actor. But having said that, you know, Nick Briggs is a very good actor, and he has provided a, an excellent Dalek voice. And in here, I think he's really relished, you know, doing the Dalek voice for for a Dalek which is which is just out with its shell casing. Um, and is also a different type of Dalek to the ev- anything that we've ever seen before because it's established that like, this is a recon- rec- reconnaissance Dalek, um, mm. which is which is new to the series. You know, the, the fact that the, the Doctor explains that this is genetically engineered completely different to anything else we've seen before. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a different type of Dalek, it's a different character. Yeah, and he, Nick, Nick Briggs did, a, did an excellent job. It was a yeah. It was it was a great performance. Very good voice. Yeah. So when the Dalek gets Lynn to go on the laptop, mm-hmm. I noticed the black archive came up. Yes. Yeah. 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 Briefly, mm-hmm. which is everyone know from the day of the Doctor, but it did first appear in the Enemy of the Bane in the Sarah Jane Adventures, which was also Nicholas Courtney's last story. Yes. Yes. It. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So yeah, that that was a nice little touch of continuity, which again is sort of you know it doesn't get in the way for general viewers who aren't aware of what the Black Archive is, because clearly it's it's this thing where weapons are accumulated, which is seen in the story. But yeah, it's it's a nice little lot for fans like us who 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 you know get these references. So that was nicely handled. Mm-hmm. So shortly after this, um, the Doctor's in the TARDIS, and this is the scene where she discovers the Dalek DNA mm-hmm. and she, has to, she, expl- she explains to everyone what a Dalek is um, which confirms that no one remembers them because we were talking back in the third, first podcast about that scene on the train when they were talking about aliens and I was saying do they know aliens exist or not because mm-hmm. it's a theme that started back in Victory of the Daleks when Amy couldn't remember the Daleks mm-hmm um, so I guess 
since then it just kind of confirms that the Battle of Canary Wharf um the whole planet in the sky thing has been gently retconned. Mm-hmm. Well, I think with those with those things, it was explained that history had rewritten itself because of the, the crack in time during the Matsuda. Yes. Era. So, but yeah, I think this is this is something different. And as as I said at the time, I think this this is something like Doctor Who. It, well, really, it's it's forced to do. I think every now and again, especially when you've got stories where the Earth is affected on such a massive scale. Because if everyone remembers it, I think at that point you kind of want either either people become blasé about it, which doesn't make great drama, or you kind of question. Well, considering how many times this has happened, why aren't people prepared for it? Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, drama- but yeah, I think you just have to accept that no one remembers these things. Mm-hmm. Like you'd think, everyone would be talking about Miracle Day still, wouldn't they? Oh, is the the Torchwood episode? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, that 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 went on for months, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, yeah, that, and that was quite devastating. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, um, it just took. No, sorry, go on. Sorry, I was just going to say another little line that Jodie Whittaker gave um, about um, defeating the Daleks. She says, um, "I learned to think like a Dalek a long time ago," mm. and I thought that was a nice little bit of insight. Um, into how how she defeats them. Yes, it does, and there's a, it gives the it gives the it gives her doctor a bit of an edge and a you know a hint of a hint of darkness there. But it also it it provides this sense of history between uh, between the doctor and the Daleks as well. So yeah, that, that that yeah that was that was a nice little dialogue with a one simple line of dialogue with a lot of with a lot going in it. Yeah. So what were you going to say? Oh no, I was I was just jumping ahead, but it was it was linked to that point with um with uh with people sort of forgetting it, which was that scene where where the doctor calls you calls for unit. Mm. What did you think of that? Hmm. I think for plot convenience, it's it's perhaps good that the um, unit wasn't available. Mm-hmm. Um. I'm not sure. In the long run, I don't appreciate it <laughs> happening. Right. Okay. Um. Obviously, there was the whole um kind of Brexit gag there in there, wasn't there? Well, that's the thing. It's sort of it's been read by a lot of people as as a Brexit gag, um, which is is taking me by surprise. I I thought it was more of a dig of um, I thought it was more of a dig of austerity. Okay. Um, but I know that there was this comment that um, lack of funding also from our international partners, which I suppose people could look into in terms of Brexit. But I thought I read it more because this was the British branch branch of it. I tell you one thing that still irritates me. I wish it was still referred to as the United Nations Intelligent Task Force. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, that's just occurred to me. Yeah, it's not a Brit- British institute. It's, um, yeah, it's the United Nations. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. But anyway, yeah, I, I read it because this is this this was the British um, this, this was the British branch of it. Uh, I thought it was more of a more of a comment on austerity rather than Brexit. But anyway, mm. yeah. Um, and I wonder this ha- this will have a knock on effect with Big Finish because they're doing the the unit series right now with Kate Stewart and Os- Osgood. True. I mean, it it could maybe it could be written off as that they just go. They just go more underground or undercover or something like that, or yeah. becomes it becomes what Torchwood was originally. Uh, maybe it could be explained like that. In terms of the series, well, one in terms of the scene itself, I quite liked it. Um, as you say, it worked in terms of the drama of the episode. I think also, again, going forward w- with future series, it will. It gets rid of the question whenever there's a major threat threatening Earth. It's like, well, why doesn't the Doctor just call for unit? It, you know, it, it, so it gets rid of that. Um, yeah. But also, the, the scene of itself, I thought, you know, it added to the drama, but I also thought it was genuinely funny. Uh, the, <laughs> the way that it was written and the way that it was performed. You had uh, Laura Evelyn play Polly, who was the, the woman on the call centre who the Doctor's talking to. Yeah. Um, which again goes to the point of going... 
Chris, that scene that Chris Chibnall had written with with a family with a Wi-Fi going down, that was a joke that just fell on its face and didn't work. But I thought this scene was a bit more witty and a bit more deftly written and, and, and was genuinely funny. Yeah, I guess it'll help um, future episodes, though. Mm-hmm. So how long is a rel? <laughs> I always thought one second. I always thought I thought it was one second as well, but because um... as soon as he said, "Oh, however many rels," I paused it, got the calculator out, mm-hmm. and I thought, "Okay, that's one hundred and fifty-six minutes." Oh, right, and right. then I resumed it, and she was like, "How long is a rel?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always thought it was just a second. Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so this girl Lynn. Mm -hmm. I'm probably jumping ahead here in the story, but by the end of the story, um, could she be facing the consequences for killing the traffic cops, (laughs) the traffic police? Oh, yeah, that's a thought. uh, mm. Assuming she was driving her own car as well. Mm. Yeah, true. And the police car probably had dash cam footage. (laughs) And all, uh, all the speed cameras have got footage of her shooting them <laughs> not if she was shooting behind them yeah but yeah no, no, but yeah. there's a lot of evidence like if if um if some of uh, if some if someone went out and did that mm-hmm. you'd think there's enough evidence for the police to get back to you and find you there'd be a big manhunt wouldn't there uh, yeah there would i think that's yeah. something for big finish to tap into yeah she goes on the run <laughs> Yeah. In fact, to be perfectly honest, because when it came to Lynn and Mitch, who I thought were great characters, the way that they were presented, I thought, oh, which one's going to die? The fact that they yes. both came out alive yeah. was, it was, a, was a major surprise, actually. A nice one, but... Yeah, I, I'd assumed it wouldn't go, go far. Someone was going to die. Mm. So I thought the climax in the TARDIS was pretty cool. Uh, did you think Ryan's dad might die? Yeah, again, there, there, there was a moment where I thought um, that was a possibility as well because there were certain instances, and which which shows, I think, that the, the writing and the direction of the story was really, really good because you thought, oh, there's a really strong possibility that not everyone may come out alive. So, as I said before, I thought Lynn and Mitch, I thought one of one of them or perhaps both of them may, may die. And yeah, um, considering they survived and... That Ryan was taken over by the dog. Yeah, I, th- I honestly thought there was a there was a chance he he could die as well. Yeah, I definitely thought that. Uh, with the scene in the cafe when he had the microwave, mm-hmm. it's like I know enough about storytelling to know that that was in the plot there for a reason. So I thought, okay, this is going to be key. Oh yeah, that, the that, that was obviously Chekhov's loaded gun. It yeah. was because it, it got mentioned then, and I just. Because I remember even turning my family when watching, just going, um, "Is that how the dog's going to be defeated?" I was yeah. like, "Yeah, maybe." Um, what they should have done is introduced the microwave, but then try to throw us off, like have a scene with a slow cooker, another scene with a blender, <laughs> and then we had to guess which kitchen appliance was going to save the day. <laughs> yes, that would have yeah. been fantastic. Bit of mystery. Yeah, a bit I, like, of... I like I like a good mystery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would have been good. Actually, talking in terms of... Did you see what uh, GCH, GCHQ actually did on their Twitter feed? No. The actual GCHQ following the broadcast of the episode, I thought this was great. They, uh, I think it was the following day, they they had a, um, the official BBC photograph of the Dalek, which was in GCHQ, and then basically saying, right, we've cleaned up, we're operating as normal. <laughs> or words to that effect. I thought, oh, that's quite nice. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. So as Chibnall stories have been going, I think this has been really well, really well written. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, despite the, the few uh, quibbles that I had before on the whole, I thought this was a very good episode. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, re- I really liked it, and is arguably probably. Well, certainly, it's. I think it's the best Dalek story that we've had since the the Christopher Eccleston era. Mm-hmm. I definitely feel like with this story, the Daleks are. Definitely back on track to becoming scary. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're definitely more of a threat, which was uh, which just the way that you know the fact that um, I mean the Dalek was really creepy, scary, evil, very tactical, which you know it really aids, uh, really aids in the threat. 
And that's the that action scene where basically the army try and stop it, and yet this one Dalek in this homemade case, but with its understanding of weaponry and, and tactics and everything like that, was, was able to destroy them all. I thought that was a really good scene. Yeah. Yeah, obviously that reminds us of uh, Remembrance, probably, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the junkyard. Is that the scene where you were talking about the CGI? Yeah, a little bit. It was just when it when it was I think when it was flying in, just the, it was just the lighting and the colouring of the CGI just looked slightly off. What did you think about the time in which it took Lynn to build the Dalek? And um, do you think it was maybe a bit quick? I know I know that she had um they had all this alien tech and bits of Daleks. Mm-hmm. But at the time scale, I, I, I know it seemed a bit quick. That never occurred to me when I was watching it, actually. But um, but thinking about it, I think I think maybe it was handled quite well because it was clearly it was clear that the Dalek mutant who was controlling her was really pushing her uh, t- to her limits and, and and forcing her to hurry up. Because there's that scene where she almost clap- collapses with exhaustion, and the Dalek you know the Daleks say, "No, you will go on." So I think it was it was sort of demonstrated that you know she, she was forced to really work up against it. And that, uh, yeah, no, I know the Dalek looked radically different in some ways, mm-hmm. but it was just a one-off, so you can't really complain, can you? No, no, I, it worked. Yeah, clearly, it's a it's, it's a one-off. It worked in terms of the story in the same way that um, I think it's oh, I've forgotten the name of it now. Is it the Pandora opens when you've got the Stone Dalek? Yes, yeah, and like a variation of the new Paradigm ones. Yeah, I mean, because that looked great, but yeah, uh, but that functions. The, the plot that that design functions the plot of the story i don't think you, it wouldn't make much sense if you had stone daleks yeah going forward. i guess i guess we'll talk about the new paradigm daleks another time mm-hmm. yeah, yeah there's yeah. a lot there's a lot to be said yeah 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 there is yeah but um out if you were to rank the story out of 10 what would you give it i'd give it 10 out of 10 if um i mean if i was a kid again this is one of the episodes I'd be rewatching a lot. Yes, yeah, I agree with yeah, yeah. And um, there's not a lot of rewatchable episodes uh, in this series for me. I think. Um, well, no, there is a lot, but there's some which um, I possibly wouldn't um, go back just yet. I'm still I'm looking forward to getting the Blu-ray. Um, I might wait a little while and then um, watch it all in order. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I oh, know that's interesting because I think at, at the this may change later on, but at the moment, uh, Rotten Tomatoes has, has ranked this episode 100%. I noticed that today, yeah. Mm-hmm. But that's by critics, and I don't trust critics. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you mean, and there's that, that whole conversation about how these things, you know, how the algorithms work and how the rank, you know, which is a which is a long conversation about, you know, how these things are reliable. But I thought that was interesting. I mean, because I think... For me, I think yes, it's a, it's a good episode, but it's not that good. I think I would give it eight out of ten. Yeah, m- maybe I'll stick with a good nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's just my opinion. If you want to give it ten out of ten, it's... <laughs> <laughs> don't let me sway you because if, if you think it's a cracking good story, that's, that's fine. I'm easily swayed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but I, th- I think at the end of the day, you know, it was it was an episode that we both in- both enjoyed, and we agree that. It was good. I was just yeah. just going off because um, the the actress who plays Polly, the call center girl, is called uh, Laura Evelyn. I, I think it was a small part, but very memorable. She played that part well. But she is also in the recent Black Mirror episode, Bandersnatch. Okay. Have you watched that? No. Ah, oh, okay. Do, do you know much about it? Yeah, yeah, I know of it. I was just talking about it yesterday, even though I haven't haven't given it a go yet. Oh, right, okay. For those that, that don't know, it's um, it's an episode of Black Mirror, which is on, on Netflix, um, which is a sort of science fiction thriller, which looks at um, the dark side of technology. Um, this is a, a new episode where you actually control the outcome of the story as you go along. So in some respects, it's sort of like a computer game. So they, they filmed it like a normal drama, but there'll be certain points where you'll make decisions using your controller on what... Um, the character does or not and I, i've watched it um she appears in the episode uh on, on one of the endings um 
I'll hold off on that. But yeah, I thought uh, I because I was a bit skeptical of it, but I know oh why not? I'll watch it. But I found it really engaging. It's a good story. Um, but it's it's set in nineteen eighty four and it's quite good. So that there's there's one of the decisions you make early on is whether which which cassette album you listen to. And I picked one and the Eurythmics comes up. And I went, oh, right, this is a good choice. Like the Eurythmic, good song. But I was really happy with the ending that I that I, that I ended up picking because, I mean, it's it's bloody depressing, but it's Black Mirror, so it's highly surprising. But, um, but the ending made sense. But I liked it because there's a, uh, there's a song by Old Superman by Laurie Anderson, which I love. And that was used over the end of it. And I went, yeah, okay, made the right decision. Huh. <laughs> anyway. No, I was just wondering if you'd watched it yet. No, I'll give it a go. Um, I did play a game last year um, called Hidden Agenda on the PS4. Have you heard of that? Oh, no, I haven't. It's a, it's a crime drama. Um, you play on your mobile phone. All oh, right, okay. So you connect your phone up to Wi-Fi with the PlayStation app or mm. the Hidden Agenda app. And um, you're basically watching a movie. You interact with it occasionally. But the the whole narrative just splinters off on your decisions, and you can play with up to four players in the room, and one person might have a hidden gender on their phone, and you pl- you you've got to persuade the other players of believing or of doing a certain action or mm. making a choice. Um, so that was something similar. Oh, that's so that was a good. good. That was a good game. What's yeah. it called? Um, hidden agenda. Hidden Agenda. All right, yeah. okay. I did have it then. I would kind of finished it. I gave it to the neighbour. So have you still got it? <laughs> Off I know. All right, okay. Um, but I, I, I didn't get the best ending to it. Um, and the problem is, if I, I, had to re, I had to replay it from the start, and it's like just watching a movie again mm. that you've just been through and hoping you'll, you'll get the right ending. So it's a little bit frustrating if you want to um, get unlock every ending, but it was good, it was a good game. Wasn't um, wasn't Silent Hill? I mean, going years back here, but wasn't Silent Hill uh, designed in a way where how you played how you played it in a certain way uh, affected the ending? So there, yeah. there, there were there were multiple endings, including a an absolutely bonkers one where it turned out the whole thing the whole thing was controlled by a dog. Yes. Um. <laughs> I remember that vaguely from Silent Hill One. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm mo- um, Silent Hill Two. I played religiously, and I got all the endings. It doesn't um, change the narrative of the story along the way, but it's just the ending in particular that's different. Ah, oh, right, okay. Um, and some other games do that. Um, I just think the Resident Evil Two that had like kind of four different scenarios to play. Both, you could play scenario A with with Leon and B with Claire, or the other way around. Mm-hmm. Um, and the story was quite different along the way. Ah, oh, right, okay. Yeah. It was like uh, when you played Resident Evil Four, when you completed it, there was uh, there was an option to play the game entirely from the perspective of the woman in the red dress. Ah, oh, right, yeah, okay. Uh, and that was quite good because um, you ended up having a completely different perspective on it. Yeah, I'm one of these people that's not a massive fan of Resident Evil Four. Oh, really? And people, well, I do, I do like it. I've played it quite a few times, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it was too much of a gameplay shift from the originals. Saying that though, I do love Resident Evil Five. Well, I haven't heard many people say that. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was probably in... probably mainly because Resident Evil Five's a cooperative game. Is that the one that's set in a? Um... An African Af- country. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's just the gameplay that I enjoyed more than anything. Not not particularly the story. Ah, right. Yeah. No, I remember I wasn't particularly keen on Resident Evil 5, but that wasn't the fault of the game. That was more me because um, I was pretty bad at it. I couldn't get past, ah, I, right. I couldn't get past the I couldn't get past the first level. Yeah. Are you talking about the bit where you you get to a building and then they all start coming at you? Yes. That's really frustrating. Um, After a while, you just get the hang of it. 
Well, like, like it's the case with most games. Uh, yeah, no, but I thought that early on it, it took me by surprise, and because uh, I was at a friend's house, so it wasn't a game that I owned, and I had a couple of attempts, and I was just, oh, I was just really bad at it. I went, oh, I don't like this. Yeah. See, I'm um, I'm looking forward to Resident Evil Two, but I've always wanted an exact remake, <laughs> and it's not going to be that at all, is it? No, probably not. I mean, one thing, one game that I am looking forward to coming out which they said that they're they're remaking but i haven't heard anything of there was some footage that was released a couple of years back but nothing's been heard since which is final fantasy 7 yeah um i played that again a couple of years ago oh, right, on, okay. the, on the ps3 mm-hmm. i enjoyed it <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah that's another one that's probably going to be radically different one thing that I am pleased coming out because I really like the Hitman games, and I've been playing Hitman Two recently. But it's just it's just been announced that later this month, I think it's on the eleventh of January, so not long actually. Um, Hit, Hit uh, Hitman Blood Money and Hitman Absolution, I think it's called. They've they've remastered those games in HD, and they're being re-released on the PlayStation Four. Um, so at some point I'll get I'll get those and play them again. I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to that. That's cool. I like the HD remasters. I got the Silent Hill one mm-hmm. and the Metal Gear Solid one too. Ah right, okay. Yeah. So I think that's all the time we've got this week. Mm-hmm. Um, coming up next week, we'll be looking at something in particular. 2019 marks 20 years of Doctor Who at Big Finish. So. As we start rediscovering the monthly range of Doctor Who, um, we'll be beginning with the first story, The Sirens of Time.